Coming up on Theater Talk. The whole idea behind unionism is that those of us who are more successful support those and help those out who are less successful. People think of actors as being these narcissistic sort of self-involved, you know, folks, and of course we are. But, um, <laughs> uh, Theater Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation. From New York City, this is Theater Talk. I'm producer Susan Haskins. And I'm Michael Riedel of the New York Post. Now, Susan, you remember, may remember in the musical Spamalot, there's a very funny song that says, uh, you can't have a Broadway musical without the Jews. Isn't that how it goes, something like that? Yes. And, and, and it's very true, because when you think about the history of the Broadway musical, it is essentially uh, created by a lot of Jewish immigrants back in the early part of the 20th century. Uh, that subject is um, uh, a new documentary now, just out on PBS, called Broadway Musicals, A Jewish Legacy. And it is put together by the uh, noted, celebrated filmmaker, Michael Cantor, who is our guest tonight on Theater Talk. Welcome. Well, thank you. Uh, yeah. This project's taken about three years to work on, and um, it will be airing on PBS as part of the Great Performances series. It's also online if you go to the PBS website. And you got a DVD coming out of it, DVD right? from Acorn in April. So let me ask you, I mean, the very simple question. Why is the American musical a product of, of, of Jews? Well, we focused on the songwriters, composers and lyricists, who are almost entirely Jewish, with the exception of a few Cole people, Porter, Cole Porter Meredith Wilson among them. Right. Um, and it's a phenomenon. You know, why is a great baseball player a phenomenon in one year has this incredible... Uh, season, it's a variety of factors. We explore them in the uh, documentary. It's the Yiddish theater. Mm -hmm. It's Jewish liturgical music that feeds into great Broadway shows. It's a Jewish ethos that says we're not just going to amuse you, but we're going to instruct you. This is, if you, if you behave a certain way, you can get the girl. You can win. You know, America is a place where that kind of optimism will reign. And a work ethic. And a work have ethic. To, you, you think of uh, George Gershwin, who you talk a great deal about, his parents buying this piano and hauling up the side of their Second Avenue tenements so that the kids could play the piano and that this little boy then becomes obsessed with the instrument and starts working when he was, what, 15, did you tell us? Yeah, right. Yes. Around. There's a Make hunger it. to succeed. Mm -hmm. Right, right. And that's but that's the immigrant culture, is it not? Yes. Yeah. And these were children of immigrants, Yip Harburg, among them who want to master the language and make wonderful little rhymes and create new musical forms as George Gershwin and Irving Berlin and all the greats do. Right. What's also interesting, and I think this comes across in the documentary too, and an issue for us to explore here is they, because they're outsiders, they're immigrants, they're hearing the sound of New York for the first time. And in their music and in their lyrics, the sound of this city that's taking off in the early 20th century they capture that. Right, well, Irving Berlin starts his career as a singer, and he's basically a busker on the street. Yeah. He's hearing the sounds of the Bowery, he's sleeping on a street bench, he's bringing home nickels to his family to support them after his father, who's a cantor, yep. has yeah. passed away. So he's heard the music of the synagogue, he's out there listening to, you know, the music calliope the and the music of the street, and that's what the Broadway musical is born of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, when you trace its roots back, where where does it where does it really begin? Uh, this is something I'm confused about because there is still the tradition of the operetta. There is uh, uh, Gilbert and Sullivan, uh, Sigmund Romberg, that sort of um, um, middle European beautiful melody that begins, I think, the musical theater in some way. Does it not? Well, there's no question that the Irish took over um, with you know, that ultimately ends up with George M. Cohan writing certain kinds of songs. But right. Gilbert and Sullivan are huge. Yep. And um, it's really with Irving Berlin and the Gershwins coming along in the teens and the 20s that the Broadway musical, as we know it, as we think of it now, shows up. Mm -hmm. But Which where so this documentary sort of pays homage is the Yiddish theater. The Yiddish yeah, theater it yeah. brings over all these great kind of European uh, operatic type traditions but it has, as Michael Tilson Thomas points out in the show, the ability to amuse and to instruct. Right. Yes. And that feeds right into Also, that. isn't don't immigrants create art forms into which they can fit? In other words, they, they were coming up with something where 
They were creating they their own careers. They could work their own careers, yeah. Right, and if you put something on the stage and people can laugh at it, you're accepted. Now, the other thing I think interesting when you trace it back to the Yiddish theater, too, is these great songwriters like Julie Stein, uh, who, 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 who we have wonderful interviews with Julie in this, in this piece, and um, Irving Berlin, they saw these larger-than-life theatrical figures of the Yiddish theater. So then when they go to the Broadway musical, they're dealing with these larger-than-life Broadway figures like Ewell Brenner or like a Carol Chan, or Ethel like Merman. Ethel Merman. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So I wonder if you could make that connection as kids growing up seeing these, they must have been towering figures of the Yiddish theater back in those days. Well, again, the one we point out is Boris Tomaszewski, yeah. and who was larger than life. He's in Mel Brooks's Producers. Yeah. I was a protege of the great Boris Tomaszewski. Oh. Yes. Yes. He taught me everything I know. And there's no question that that influenced people like George and Ira Gershwin, Irving Berlin. John Kander, in his interview with us, uh, just remarked that he was, he lamented that he just missed it. He'd come to New York in 1950 and most of those guys were gone. Tomaszewski died in the mid-30s. Yeah, yeah. But uh, some, you know, I think a, a carryover of that tradition was the great Zero Mostel. Yeah. Who arguably, you know, is the lead of the most famous Jewish musical of all time, Fiddler on the Roof. Well, Fiddler on the Roof break down, breaks down the doors for the Broadway musical, whereas before that, you had stories where, say in Showboat, a black mulatto woman could be seen as passing and the Jewish experience is channeled through those kind of stories. Right. And not a their poor own story. cockney flower girl right. who, you know, is the outsider. And along comes Fiddler on the Roof and you have a pure Jewish story and it becomes the longer yeah, And, and because we can't take away that the, the Jews were discriminated against, I mean up until very recently, a, a very profound discrimination existed where, you know, in, in, in the 50s, you have Comden and Green writing in a culture where clubs are restricted, Jews mm -hmm. were treated horribly, and, and uh, I don't think that they would have had the influence if they hadn't been bucking against uh, uh, discrimination. Well, Charles Strauss, in this documentary, yeah. Broadway Musicals, A Jewish Legacy, tells his own story of spending a summer at a tobacco farm in Connecticut, of all places and encountering the fiercest kind of anti-Semitism. When I was growing up, my father thought it would be good for us to work on a farm. He was in the tobacco business and sent us up to a farm. And we saw right away that the young men were virulently uh, anti-Semitic. Everybody was the Jew boss, the Jew driver. So my brother and I made a pact to say if they should ever ask us that we were Greek Orthodox. <laughs> Greek Orthodox, because we were dark, you know, fairly dark. And, uh, but one day they uh, said that uh, you guys are Jewish, my brother and me. And they started to beat up my brother, about six of them. And then they tied me to a tree. They tied me to a tree and put papers under it and lit a fire. And then the straw boss, whose name was Murphy, came along and they said, oh, here comes, here comes the Jew boss, we better stop. And, and uh, he set us free. Didn't say anything about it. He said, all right, come on, lunchtime is over. That was all. And you can't help but think that that in some way gets transformed into the incredible optimism that he brings to a show like Annie. Fiddler, I think, is important. I remember Jerry Robbins. I think I saw an interview with him years ago where it was a statement because Robbins and Sheldon Harnick and Jerry Bach and um, um, who wrote the book to uh, Fiddler on the Roof? Joe Stein. Joe Stein. They had relatives who were killed by the Germans. Mm -hmm. They had family members who were killed in the Holocaust. Mm. And this Fiddler on the Roof was saying, the world may try to destroy us, but this culture, this tradition, the Jews, we will survive and go on. And that's what Fiddler's about. Well, Irving Berlin's first memory, apparently, was of seeing his home burned down to the ground in Russia from a pogrom. They were hiding in a ditch by the street. He was four years old or something, and they ultimately come to America on, a, on the SS Rhineland and come through Ellis Island. And it's remarkable that in a period of roughly 70 years, that event that shapes Irving Berlin's consciousness becomes high art in the Broadway musical in Fiddler, where a pogrom is enacted. We've reached a point where some people think the, uh, the great American musical theater is over, the golden age, they say, is over with. Do you agree with that? And do you think maybe 
the Jewish tr traditions have now been so assimilated into the mainstream that we're never going to have that sound again? I think what our film points out is that um, these great titans of the musical theater, the Leonard Bernsteins and Rodgers and Hart and Rodgers and Hammerstein and so on, they created a form. And now it was never an exclusive club. Now uh, Lin-Manuel Miranda and uh, Elton John and everyone else, they're very happy to fill that form. But essentially, the form was created by Jewish songwriters. Yeah, yeah. And this very interesting bit of tension, I thought, in your movie uh, with Stephen Sondheim and Julie Stein. There's a lovely bit where you have an old interview with Julie and he's talking about writing for Merman, you know, and, and then the key change goes out. I just got it. He said, that's the Merman sound. And the audience is waiting for that. They've come to see Merman and I'm going to give them what they've come to see. And then you cut to Steve Sondheim and Steve talks about working with Julie. And he said, well, you know, Julie would write the song and Merman would belt it. It's like <laughs> I, he was not interested in that form and he would then go on to to make his own form of, um, I guess, what you would say, serious, adult, darker, musical And not star-driven. I think it was Mark Shaman who says in the movie, too, that... Stephen Sondheim changed Broadway. He created a world where you can write about everything and anything, and nothing's off limits. All sorts of music can be used to go from Sweeney Todd and, and Passion to the pastiche work and Follies, or the contemporary music of its time that was in company, and on and on and on. But the bad part is he, he, he made it that everyone's expecting that now from everyone. And not everyone can deliver that. And sometimes you go to the theater and you don't want that. It hasn't really led anywhere. Steve could do it and no one after Steve, they've all tried, the Michael John Lacuses and the, the uh, John, um, uh, 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 Robin. I'm not helping you. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're all three names and no tunes. <laughs> they're writing these dark shows, but they don't have that thing that Steve had because he still comes from the old Christian musical theater. You can have melancholy in it, but you also have to put over side by side. I think what Mark Shaman is pointing out is that Steve helped to expand the form in a way that made room for people to do experimental stuff. And whether they do it as well or as adventurously as he does, it's hard to say. Yes, yeah, so he made it more contemporary. It's well, but it's a reason why it's only, Shaman and Whitman are the only one of that generation of songwriters who are writing hit shows. Well, no, Broadway, no, no. they write in the great tradition of the musical theater with zing and pep We and hyperbolize, darling. <laughs> <laughs> let's look You're forward. You're in a minefield here. Let's look forward. So <laughs> the, the, we're the, out of it. The, <laughs> The movie is called Broadway Musicals, A Jewish Legacy, a really terrific um, piece of, uh, of American history and New York City history and theater history. Uh, Michael Cantor is the producer and writer and director of the movie. It's on PBS stations, DVD. You can streamline it on... Great uh, performances. Great performances. Hey, Michael Cantor, <laughs> thanks for being our guest. Thank you. Talk. Pleasure. If I were a rich man, a dear, 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 no. All day long I'd be, 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 if I were a wealth. Uh, Susan, there is a big anniversary on Broadway now, Actors' Equity, the legendary union that looks after all of the fabulous performers here in New York and across the country, is celebrating its centennial. And to mark that, uh, there's a book out called Performance of the Century, 100 Years of Actors' Equity Association and the Rise of the Professional American Theater. It's by a good friend of ours, Robert Simonson, who seems to be cracking out a couple of books a year, Robert. I don't know. How many books have how you many books, written? How many books have you written now? Uh, this is the fourth. This is the That's fourth. all? God, I, uh, would have, yeah. I would have thought you'd written about 12. I'm glad it seems like more. It seems like more. <laughs> it felt like more. Uh, and we're also joined by the president of Actors Equity, a terrific, terrific Broadway actor, Mr. Nicholas Wyman. Welcome to Theater Talk. Thank you. Good Thank you. And you've got your Actors Equity uh, card on. I am representing. That's right. <laughs> All right, Robert, you're the historian here. Take us back. Why did the actors feel they needed a union back in, what, 1900? 19, well, 13. It's the centenary. Um, uh, because uh, the actor's lot was, unless you were a star, like uh, Maude Adams or Ethel Barrymore or someone like that, right. or Mrs. Fisk, um, <laughs> Scam. Your, your, your life could be pretty dreary. You, you had no recourse, you had nothing to fall back on, and um, things could happen to you uh, that, uh, that would be pretty miserable. Like if a show was on the road and it didn't do well and the show closed down, you would be abandoned there, you would be left there, and you'd have to find your own way back home. Um, the stars would be brought back home, but uh, not the uh, rank-and-file Everybody actors. else thrown out in the alley as if they were, you know, the sets that were torn down. Stranded yes. again. <laughs> <laughs> again. And you had to buy your own costumes? 
you had to buy your own costumes, and in the days, in those days, especially for an actress, you know that could be very prohibitive you, because there are all these costume dramas. Um, you you had to rehearse indefinitely, as long as the producers would say you would rehearse for one month, two months, with absolutely no pay. You would do previews with no pay. Um, basically, they treated the actors like chattel. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, every other faction of the theater had rights. You know, the uh, stagehands and the various designers and. Uh, but the actors, not at all. Still and like so, that today, Nick? No. <laughs> <laughs> I Have you ever had an experience, though, in your long and storied career where you felt uh, you're being treated like a, a chattel, you know, back in the days? Uh, ever gone through any of that? I think, I think it's, it's true that most actors, certainly before they get the job, you know, they, you know there is the, the cattle call or the chattel call, if you will, um, <laughs> uh, where, you know, where you're sort of herded in, into the, uh, the, the holding pen and, and then you go out and you moo your 16 bars and they say thank you when you, you know, <laughs> shuffle off stage, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it's, it's, a, a diff it's a very difficult life and it's remarkable um, that people endure it and that they go through it and Concerning how few people have, you know, a level of success that enables them to to, to raise a family, but it's um, but people don't go into acting to 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 for for money. The way it works is that you know waves of thousands and thousands of people wash up on the shores of, of New York and Los Angeles every year. You know, dream with stars in their eyes and you know hoping to be stars or at least be you know successful. And and the business grinds them down after and after a certain point, they see all their friends have you know cars and and and, and houses and, and careers and spouses and, and 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 money in the bank and they don't and they think okay i'm you know i'm not getting enough from this business i'm, I'm going to leave it but they've been replaced by the you know the thousands, the thousands new, yeah, the but new. there are those who stick it out and 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 who become successful those who stick it out and become only moderately successful because they have that drive and that dream and it's 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 a very moving thing for me as the as the president of the union sort of as the titular father of you know of, of all these 49,000 kids who are like trying to yeah. m make 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 a go of it that 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 you know that I want them all to succeed 49,000 just get back to the history of equity here so they decide they need a union who who is the driving force here and and they it was just a a, it was just a collection of actors you know who thought this would be a good idea they started gathering in each other's apartments and they got together and um, they got a good collection of actors they didn't necessarily have a whole lot of stars but really, the producers did not listen to them for a good six years. They only listened to them when they went out on strike in 1919. But not all of the stars of the day, though, supported the union. And there was, like, Mrs. Fisk, I think, did not join the union, <laughs> correct? There were some scabs in, in your ranks back yeah. then. <laughs> well, um, she didn't need it, Mrs. Fisk. The stars didn't need it. The, the stars who were uh, successful, like Mrs. Fisk and the Barrymores, they were very well treated by the producers. They were pampered. They got great salaries, they were given apartments and wonderful roles. They didn't need a union. Well, the stars, though, are very important, I think, to the union because just for your, your pension and welfare plans, they're the big earners, so those part of their paychecks go in to uh, support your, uh, the, 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 the pension and welfare, don't they, in act Actors' Equity? Absolutely, absolutely. Of course, there's a cap on, 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 <laughs> on those things. Yeah. But, it's, it's, but it's, it's, it is, you know, one for all, all for one. I mean, that is, that is the driving force, and it is... What keeps the union, it's the whole idea behind unionism, is that those of us who are more successful support those and help those out who are less successful. People think of actors as being these narcissistic sort of self-involved, you know, folks, and of course we are. But, um, <laughs> uh, but it's, it's also true that, that, that in order to be an actor, you have to be able to put yourself in, into the shoes of somebody else. All sorts of extraordinary social causes have been taken up by, by actors because we are people who care about other people and, and, and can put ourselves in, in the other person's shoes. And you're used to being outsiders, too. Exactly. Oh, that's true. You know, you're never really a part of an establishment. Because you were in Les Miserables. Remember when Cameron McIntosh um, fired everybody in Les Mis? Well, not all of them, but a, a, a significant number. Did significant they fire number. you? No, I was one of the people who got the job when they fired the oh. other people. <laughs> <laughs> so we love that part. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I remember going over to the offices of Actors' Equity. I mean, it was a really big deal back then. The union was furious. Why did he fire everybody? <clears throat> because the, I think he thought the show was stale. not yeah, getting stale and people were staying in the jobs too long. But I went there and Sarah Jessica Parker and Matthew Broderick were right there leading the, leading the charge for Actors' Equity. And they, they were the ones that all the press wanted to talk to. So, you know, the stars can play an integral part. Before we go away from 1919, I want to talk about the most egregious hold router for the, your union, George M. Cohan. There were a few performers more famous than he. He was, yes. he was a writer, he was a director, he was a performer, he was a producer. He was also a producer, I think. That's he was Mr. a producer. Broadway. Yeah, uh, back in those days, there were a lot of actors who were all, all, 
also producers, and almost to a man, they went on the producer's side. They decided that the producer in me was more important than the actor in me. They don't talk about it, that in Yankee Doodle Dandy. No, no, no. He's got this this wonderful, you know, Americana image no, now, yeah, and, and nobody knows that he was like a big union buster. What are some of the issues confronting the union today? I mean, you have uh, negotiations periodically with the producers. What are the things that you, as the head of the union, are really going to push for um, uh, when you have your next contract negotiation? I think one of the, the issues, the, the business is changing. You know, we are we have a, a different business model mm -hmm. and we want to be as effective in representing our, our, our members as the producers are in, in reaching their audiences. And I think you know, the things that we're always looking for you know, are, are, are compensation and, and working conditions, those are the, the issues. But, it, but one of the, the things that, that, uh, that, you know, that I feel takes wrong the heart because I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a very successful Broadway hack. I work a lot on, on Broadway, so I'm, I, I'm okay. But, but most of my members, particularly those who live elsewhere in the country, are not doing so okay. And I want to figure out a ways that they can do what they love to do, what they want to do, stay part of the union, and, 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 and make some money. And that's, that's, a, that's a tough issue. And part of it is, uh, is an issue that doesn't speak to so, so much, you know, just issues of, of the union and, and, and our negotiations, but it's a, it's a broader, broader conversation to make the whole country, the whole theater going public, and, and legislatures realize what a, what a valuable thing theater is, what an amazing visceral experience it is to be in, in the same physical space with actual real people who are going through stuff and to experience that, that for yourself. It's, it's an amazing art form. But don't you have the problem where producers will think, particularly out in the country, you can go out and get actors very easily. Maybe not good ones, <laughs> but producers well, could argue, why am I going to pay non-equity tours for, for this? Well, yeah. well, because you want to you want to build your brand and you want to build your future audience and you want to make sure people see that you want to put the best product out that you possibly can mm -hmm. afford. Because if you put a, an, an inferior product and and there are some very good non-equity you know shows, but if you put an you know an inferior product out there, that's going to hurt your future business. Mm -hmm. I mean, people, your audiences come to your subscription. And they say. You know, I saw that production of you know oh, right. guys and dolls that they did at, at the you know at the theater there in, in wherever you know, and it wasn't much better than my, my my kids' production in high school. I don't know that I'm going to buy the subscription next season. Mm. And so it's 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 a question of of being able to create the demand in you know from from the audience, which comes back to my my issue is you have to like you know start this conversation with the audience and make them, make them think that's the best possible way I could celebrate my anniversary or a birthday or, you know, or another event is to go to the theater. That would be really Well, cool. there's a quality of difference between going to see a, and I think the word is very important here, professional American theater, mm -hmm. professional actors as opposed to, you know, my mother's theater group doing MAME with uh, all the ladies of the town. It was fun, but it's not the same as seeing, <laughs> you know, Angela Lansbury to it. Robert. I'm quoting Nick from his foreword to your book. He okay. says, our job as a union is often to keep actors from being taken advantage, not by producers, but by themselves. How are <laughs> actors taking advantage of themselves? Because, because we, we love what we do, we would do it for free. Exactly. I mean, I, 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 you, you allow know, I, yourselves I, to be taken advantage. I, I, I joke that it's written on bathrooms all over you know, New York City, Nick Wyman will work for free, or $100 in a bottle of water. <laughs> I mean, I'm doing two readings of, of new musicals this, this month, right. you know, for $100 in a bottle of water. Because I love working on new material, and it's like, you know, when I figure out, you know, the amount of time, it's 29 hours, mm -hmm. you know, divided into, you know, $100, not quite minimum wage. On a practical level, though, I think one of the issues that uh, I hear from my actor friends is these workshops are getting longer and longer and longer and more and more elaborate. And some of the actors feel that they're kind of being used uh, for elaborate backers auditions and they should be compensated a little bit more than they are right now. Do you agree with that? It's, it's, it's tough on both sides. I mean, I, I, I get one of the issues you were talking with Michael Cantor earlier about the, you know, the, the, the Broadway the Jewish legacy, the Broadway musicals, and it's, it's, the golden age is still here. The trouble is it's, it's, it requires more gold to put the musicals on these days. <laughs> so much gold, in fact, that, you know, that Mark Shaman and, 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 and those guys, and, uh, and, you know, and, 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 and Aaronson Flaherty, they have dozens of musicals in them. Yeah. I mean, even, even Cantor and Ebbett, Cantor and Ebbett have, have, had, had a, 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 a yeah. trunk of like five musicals when, when Fred died that hadn't, they hadn't been able to get And back on. in the days, so there would be a new Cantor and Ebb show every year, exactly. a new Halpern show, and, and, a new Sondheim and, show every year. And, and you wouldn't remember the, the, the six flops, you would remember the, you know, the, the, the six successes. Cabaret, yeah. 
you know, but nowadays it costs, you know, 12, 15 million bucks or whatever to get a musical on, and it's hard to raise that money. And the workshops themselves are, are a quarter of a million dollars, $300,000 for, for, for a workshop now. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Very so. interesting. All right, the book is called Performance of the Century, 100 Years of Actors' Equity Association and the Rise of Professional American Theater by Robert Simonson, celebrating the centenary of Actors' Equity. Thanks for a lot for being our guest, And Robert. it's a gorgeous book filled with pictures, yeah. we have to say. I mean, it's a big, yes. it's, it's it, terrific. Yes. You, wrote, you don't know how to read, you're still going to be able to enjoy Just like looking at the pictures? You wrote a Good terrific book. book, but it's gorgeous. All right. <laughs> big pull out here of Nick Wyman, too, the uh, president <laughs> of the <laughs> Actors' Equity Association. There you are. Oh, okay. And it looks like you're looking at a centerfold there. Right. Right. <laughs> Call me when those uh, negotiations heat up with the... Uh, with the producers again. I always love to, to, to some dirt. Okay. the fights between the producers and the actors. We don't fight. We, we, we are on the same side. You know, we want to produce great theater. Our thanks to the Friends of Theater Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theater Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Lowe Foundation, the Eleanor Naylor Dana Charitable Trust, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, the Noel Coward Foundation, Carrie J. Fries, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, and the New York State Council on the Arts, a state agency. We welcome your questions or comments for Theatre Talk. Thank you and good night.